Hello and welcome to GameSack. I thought it'd be fun to take a look at some older franchises that got a second chance or at least some attempt was made to revive them at one point. Kind of the opposite of the franchise killer's idea. Now, this sometimes works to bring new life and excitement to the series, but not always. Anyway, let's get into it. Splatterhouse from Namco hit the arcades in 1998. You play as Rick and your girlfriend Jennifer has been kidnapped by scary monsters. You put on an evil mask which gives you crazy powers and you battle your way to save her, if you can. The game was considered pretty gory for the time, though nothing about it ever grossed me out much. Cause you know me, I'm super tough. Then again, I mostly played the TurboGrafx-16 version, which is just as fun. They did censor the North American version of this one though to get rid of some of the religious imagery. Overall, this is a great game and definitely my favorite Splatterhouse by a mile. The series did see two sequels on the Genesis, which weren't bad. At least the lineage was still going, so that was good. Heck, there was even Splatterhouse won Paku Graffiti on the Famicom. Everyone had a chance to love Splatterhouse. There was no stopping this series. But after Splatterhouse 3 came out in 1993, that was all she wrote and we wouldn't see any new entries in the series for a long time. Not for another 17 years. In 2010, Namco brought back Splatterhouse. That's right, it's just called Splatterhouse, and it's for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. This is the PS3 game, but both are basically identical in every way. The game is now in 3D, and the gameplay doesn't even try to mimic the old games. Well, I guess the closest comparison would be Splatterhouse 3 on the Genesis, as it's kind of a beat-em-up. Your mask now has lots of toot, and you're once again off to rescue Jennifer in this reboot. You face a bunch of enemies at once, and they are bullet sponges, or melee attack sponges, I guess. As you can see, there's lots of red liquid everywhere. It's so over the top that it's hard to be grossed out. There's lots of different combos, moves, and special finishes you can do. It's not as gross as the modern Mortal Kombat games, but back in the ancient year of 2010, this was some of the goriest stuff you could get in games. I like how your wounds heal over time, like regrowing an entire new arm. But if you can do that, why is my ribcage always showing through gashes in my skin? Shouldn't that heal? Gotta say though, that the combat doesn't feel especially solid. The impacts feel soft, which makes your punches and other attacks seem ineffective, even though the enemy will definitely die after a few dozen hits. It's not very satisfying to defeat your enemies. I think this could have probably been fixed with better sound design. It needs harder punch and attack sounds. You know what sound effect is in here a lot? Rags, wet, squishy rags. So wet, so squishy. So raggy. The graphics struggled to maintain 30 frames per second, but that was just the gaming landscape back in 2010. At least it's V-Synced. Overall, this isn't a horrible game, but I do find myself becoming disinterested the more I play. Your mileage, however, may vary. And as such, Splatterhouse as a franchise hasn't seen any life since 2010. Doom from id Software was first released on PC in 1993. This is one of the most influential video games ever. It's been ported everywhere and I'm playing it on the PlayStation 4 because why not? It's definitely an interesting way to play Doom as it was originally meant to be played with only a keyboard. It's true. It looks pretty cool here as well. Hopefully I don't really have to explain what Doom is. It's like explaining Pac-Man. Everyone should know what this is by now. But of course, it got exclusive follow-ups on other consoles like Doom 64 here. I'm also playing this on the PS4 and wow, I can see what I'm doing on this console, unlike the Nintendo 64 original. Honestly, I never realized how fun this game actually is. 
It turns out that playing it with a good controller and actually being able to see it drastically improves the game. Who knew? It also got direct follow-ups like Doom 3 here. This was definitely the most undoom-like Doom game there was at the time. This one is more like a survival horror game with lots of narrative than the fast-paced action of the originals. Doom as a franchise never really died or even went away, but a franchise doesn't necessarily need to be dead to be resurrected. At least those are the fast and loose rules I'm playing with for this show. I just want to talk about games, and the themes for these episodes is that they're just an excuse. Anyway, in 2016, Bethesda, who is now in charge of the publishing, released Doom. Yep, just calling it the same as the original again. You can't get much more creative than that. Anyway, this was really a resurrection or perhaps a resurgence of the franchise. This came out for all of the modern platforms of the time, and like all the Doom games in the segment, I'm playing it on the PlayStation 4. This one is action-oriented, but since it's a modern game, they definitely squeeze some story in there. Fortunately, it doesn't get too much in the way of the action. You can now gain health by finishing enemies in a certain way when they flash. The game moves really fast, and it makes me a little queasy. Not because of the gore, just motion sickness as these types of games tend to do. But still, this was upgraded nicely for the modern era, and it was fairly popular way back in the day seven years ago. In fact, it won Action Game of the Year at the generically named Game Awards of 2016. But then, in 2020, we got Doom Eternal for all of the modern platforms. Did I say I was playing all these on the PS4? Well, actually, I'm playing this one on the PlayStation 5 this time. What sucks about this one is that you have to register an account with Bethesda to play, even single player, even offline. I couldn't find a way around this like I could in the other games. Dumb. But besides that, holy hell, is this game freaking awesome! Way, way better than 2016 Doom. Now, I know that not everyone is going to agree with that statement, but hey, it's okay if you're wrong. Like that one, you do a special type of kill to gain back some health. But here, you can also use a chainsaw to slice enemies to get some ammo back. I love it. Of course, your chainsaw will run out of gas after being used a few times, but you can find more gas around if you look. Not only that, but you can burn enemies to get some armor shards. There's tons of stuff like this in here. You're often overwhelmed with the number of enemies, so you need to do your best to kill them while keeping your life and ammo up. While it's similar to the 2016 Doom, the action is faster and way more intense here. I died quite a bit, but always tried again. I like how you can now climb certain vertical surfaces as well. It's really fun just getting around in this game. What's more is that I never once experienced even a tiny bit of motion sickness with this one. The graphics are incredible, at least they are on the PlayStation 5. To get the upgraded, more modern version, you need to buy it for the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One, and once you put the disc in, you'll download the PS5 or Xbox Series X builds. Or you can just download them straight away if you buy it digitally. Not ideal, but at least it's free, I guess. Tough luck, Switch owners. I hadn't played this one until now, and suddenly I am in love with this game. Every time after I finish playing this game for the day, I feel like I can take on the world. They definitely got this one right. However, this one didn't win anything at the generically named Game Awards, probably because of that mandatory Bethesda login. Doom is in good hands, or at least it was when they made this one. Check it out if you haven't. Sometimes a franchise has so many spin-offs that the whole thing can seem like kind of a blur. But what about when they revive the main part of the franchise itself? As most of you know, Mega Man got to start back in 1987 when Capcom released his first game on the NES. You guide the little guy around, dispose of bosses, and repurpose their weapons for your own selfish use. I've never felt like the most qualified person to talk about Mega Man as I never got hugely into it. 
Well, I got into Mega Man 2, but that was mostly for the outstanding music. I don't care what anyone says, no other Mega Man game has tunes this memorable. Anyway, these games went all the way up to Mega Man 8 on the PlayStation and Saturn here, which was released in early 1997, nearly 10 years after the original. Capcom also had the Mega Man X spin-off series as well as a few others, so Mega Man has never been fully gone, but they stopped caring about the mainstream games. That is, until another 10 years passed, actually 11, when Capcom released Mega Man 9 digitally only for the Wii, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360 in 2008. I'm playing the Xbox 360 version on the Xbox Series X here. It was developed by Inti Creates, the powerhouse behind Mighty No. 9. Hmm. Anyway, they decided to go all the way back to the NES aesthetics for this one instead of Super NES or a 32-bit style that they used in the previous Mega Man games. Feels backwards to me, but I guess nobody remembers Mega Man 7 or 8. I just wish they had also released an actual NES version. That would have interested me far more. Also, you gotta admit, that would have been super cool. Unfortunately, they have a very blurry image filter on here, and there are zero options to adjust it. You can turn off the flicker in the options, so at least there's that as far as modern amenities go. Otherwise, it obeys all the NES graphical and sound rules. As for the game, well, it's classic Mega Man. Eight more stages with eight more bosses, and I'm assuming a Wily Tower-like experience after defeating all of the stages. I'm not good enough at the game to find out, but it's not hard to guess the formula here. There are some parts that require genuine skill without benefit of memorization, though, and I found those quite enjoyable. Of course, I'm going in blind. I didn't look at any guides to see which order I should face the bosses in, but I'm guessing Galaxy Man here is probably not a great choice to face first. They reused a lot of graphical assets from the previous NES games, and I wish they would have been a bit more creative. The music ranges from average to pretty good. I feel that the Splash Woman stage here has the best music. Overall, I can tell this is a solid game, but once again, it's just something that's not right up my alley. I can see why Mega Man fans really enjoyed it, though. Mega Man 9 was successful enough for them to create Mega Man 10, released digitally in 2010 for the same platforms. To me, this one feels like a downgrade compared to Mighty Mega Man number 9. We get the same blurry visuals, but now there's a border around the screen with artwork, if you can call it that. You can't turn it off or change it at all. The game itself is also less interesting. None of the stages really did anything to alleviate my boredom as I played. You can choose to play as Proto Man if you want, but guess what? I found him annoying. Are you surprised? That's because he has a little whistle whenever he appears, and that's enough to make me choose Mega Man instead. There's now an easy mode, which I haven't yet tried, but it would be good for those new to the franchise. I think if I ever get a hankering to play a retro-looking but modern Mega Man game that's also quite blurry, I'll stick with Mega Man 9. But wait, I also have Mega Man 11 for the PlayStation 4, which was released physically. I barely even remember buying this. It came out in 2018, and it's also on a Switch, Xbox One, PC, and the Amazon Luna, which, come on, nobody has that. Finally, they made the game with some modern systems in mind. That means no more blurry 8-bit pixels. Again, the formula is the same. Defeat the first eight levels in an order of your choosing, using special weapons and items you get from each stage. And these stages are pretty long. There are checkpoints, but these stages are lengthy compared to even Mega Man 9 and 10. This one offers the double gear system where you can tap a button to increase your speed or your attack power for a very short time. This can be helpful in situations like here where I die trying to rely on my skill. After I died and came back, I used the speed gear to get past this part quite easily. You can't just use these willy-nilly though, as they need time to become usable again. 
Still, I didn't find myself using either of these gears very much. The graphics are nothing mind-blowing, but they're certainly fine. In fact, I really like how Torchman stage here looks since it's outdoors and it has more going on. The music is also fine and not annoying at all, but at the same time, it doesn't really stand out. It'll be interesting to see if they make more Mega Man proper games or if they just stop here at 11 forever. What do you think they'll do? Out of these three new ones, I think I like Mega Man 9 the most, though I'd like it even more if I were playing it on my NES. Blaster Master from Sunsoft was released on the NES in 1988. I loved this game back then, and I still love it today. The story of the international version of the game has you exploring caves in the souped-up tank that you found. You're looking for your mutated frog that escaped. You can hop out of your tank and explore and even do battle on foot. It also shifts to an overhead view when you enter certain areas while on foot. As you progress through the game, you'll get new abilities for your tank, allowing you to make it to new areas. That's right, it's a Metroidvania! So watch out for Ridley and Mother Brain while you make your way to Dracula's chambers in Blaster Master. Everything about this one from the control, the graphics, and the incredible music make this an instant classic. For the next 12 years, Blaster Master would go on to have a few follow-ups, some of them actually decent, but none of them quite lived up to the original. Then nothing for 10 years. In 2010, Sunsoft attempted to resurrect Blaster Master for the first time with the help of Gaijin Works, and we got Blaster Master Overdrive on the Wii. This digital-only title didn't create a huge splash, and it doesn't give the best first impression. However, I found that you start to enjoy it a lot more the more you play it. The areas are ridiculously huge, and the game progresses a bit more slowly than the original. There are safe spots, but they are few and far between. Decent graphics and music help things out, but I do wish that the game had a progressive scan option. Since it sometimes relies on static screens that scroll only when you get to the edge of them, a widescreen option probably wouldn't have worked well. Then, seven years go by with pretty much nothing. And then that year, 2017, is when we got Blaster Master Zero by Inti Creates, the powerhouse behind Mighty No. 9. This was released for the Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. I'm playing on the PlayStation 4 here, but it doesn't matter as all versions are basically going to be identical. The story is basically a reboot slash sequel to both the Japanese and North American versions of the original. This one starts you off by chasing your frog and finding the tank again. This game goes for a pixelated retro look. It doesn't attempt to strictly adhere to 8 or even 16-bit aesthetics, especially when it comes to the number of things on screen and the scrolling. It's pixel art, but it can do some cool stuff when it needs to. I like the way it looks. I also appreciate that they didn't put a blur filter on it. They're learning. The same can be said of the sound. It sounds 8-bit, but the only real restraint it obeys is staying in mono, unfortunately. A lot of the music is redone here, but it's mostly new stuff, and a lot of it is quite good. Right away, everything should feel familiar if you played the first game, as the first area here is basically the same, just dressed up all nice. You can still get out of the tank and still explore by yourself in overhead areas. This time, your hand is held a little bit as you're told the general direction that you need to go via map screens and an on-screen flashing light. It's fine, the game is pretty big, and it's almost welcome. Everything about this one is extremely fun, and I highly recommend it. This was so successful that they kept releasing Blaster Master Zero games every two years. That means in 2019, we got Blaster Master Zero 2. This one uses the same exact engine from the first Blaster Master Zero. It adds a few new things, like hard landings, granting some of your SP back. This one's also a bit tougher than part one. 
I guess maybe some reviewer complained that the first one was too easy and they listened to them. True story, that actually happened. As a result, the bosses are a bit more cunning and their life meters are bigger. You may die a few times where you didn't in the last game, but you can still get past them and they're fun to fight. The environments can be a bit more organic this time around as well since you're going from planet to planet. Sometimes in the overhead sections you'll have to find keys to unlock doors which is another interesting addition to the gameplay. There are other tank pilots that you can find and of course you need to do battle with them first. The graphics are the same quality and the music is pretty good as well. I've got to admit though that some weird masochistic side of me wanted to see the first level from Blaster Master 2 on the Genesis recreated in this style. Oh well. I do prefer the first game, but this one isn't bad at all. Then in 2021, we got Blaster Master Zero 3. Once again, a lot more of the same, but there are some minor changes, specifically the game engine. The scaling of the pixel art is actually much worse, giving the graphics a more uneven and chunky feel than the previous two games. This also results in a lot more ugly shimmer when the screen scrolls. This one also adds voices to the game, but only in Japanese, regardless of your language settings. I'm honestly not sure why they added this. However, if you don't like it, you can turn it off. The music, fortunately, is still pretty good. By this point, I think the game's story was starting to take itself a little bit too seriously, though. I just want to play some Blaster Master. I really honestly don't care about the story that much. This one wraps up that story quite nicely if you care about it, so it's unlikely we'll see a Blaster Master Zero Part 4, but who knows? I'm just glad that the Blaster Master franchise got a second life. Okay, I got two more franchises to talk about today, and this first series I did not expect to go on as long as it does, but hey, it was fun to do, and I hope you enjoy watching it as much as I enjoy making it, but you won't. Sega Rally Championship roared into the arcades in 1994. You might not believe this, but it's from Sega. In this game, you drive your car around the track and try to beat the other cars. Pretty revolutionary stuff for 1994. Being an arcade game, there are only three tracks to race on, with a fourth hidden track if you're good enough to beat the first three. In the championship mode, you race them all consecutively and the timer carries over to the next race. The arcade version is quite difficult to make it past the second track, even when it's set to its easiest mode. But there's a practice mode where you can race three laps around any course of your choosing, except the hidden track. The graphics on the Sega Model 2 board were incredible for their time. The music was pretty good too, but not quite as memorable as Daytona USA, which preceded it. Very long, easy ride, maybe. Of course, it came to the Saturn in 1995. It took a hit in the graphics and the frame rate, but it still looked outstanding for the console. The difficulty was rebalanced, the physics from the arcade were retained exactly, and the music was improved a ton. This is, honestly, my favorite way to play the first game. Finish! Sega wanted to do a sequel, so in 1998 we got Sega Rally Championship 2 in the arcades. This was another great one, running on the Model 3 arcade hardware this time. It looks and sounds fantastic. 100, easy left, narrow, bridge. 100, easy left, maybe. 150, cross, K right. 150, K right. Of course, you could always play the Dreamcast version instead. This was a launch game and greatly expands on the arcade with more modes and more cars. Unfortunately, it has its own issues. 
It has a wildly inconsistent frame rate. Yes, there is a secret code that supposedly improves the frame rate, but instead it seems to lock it at 30 frames per second. That's certainly better than a variable frame rate, but why did they need to get rid of so much trackside detail to lock it at the lower frame rate? There's a reason they hit that mode. If they hadn't insisted on using Windows CE for this game, I'm sure it could have been a lot better. After Sega Rally 2, we wouldn't see anything from the series for a long time. Until 2006, that is when we got Sega Rally 2006, exclusively on the PlayStation 2 and only in Japan. This not only features an arcade mode, but a full-fledged career mode as well. This one has tons and tons of tracks. The colors look rather dull and lifeless, but this was all the rage at the time. The music also isn't quite as exciting compared to the first two games. Still, this one is quite fun with good visuals and sound. I highly recommend playing it if you can. It's just too bad that most of the world doesn't even know this one existed. It also came bundled with an extra disc containing the emulated arcade version of the first game, handled by M2. Sega tried once again in 2007 to bring the brand back with Sega Rally Revo, which was released on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, PC, and PSP. For most people, this was the first time they saw Sega Rally since the Dreamcast launched back in 1999. This one was developed by Westerners, and it doesn't quite have that Sega Rally feel. But does that mean it's bad? Well, yeah, kind of. All of the cars are extremely twitchy to control. When you press a direction, the car turns faster than the environment, making things feel really sloppy. As a result, you'll probably do a lot of fishtailing. If you play in first-person mode, the environment reacts more how it should, and it helps a lot. But personally, I don't enjoy playing racing games in this mode. But if you like to play in first-person mode, then this issue won't seem like such a big deal. There are plenty of modes and track variations to race on here. When this game came out, much was said about the track deformation. You know, the tracks that cars leave in the mud and snow and whatnot. It does affect the physics a little bit as you drive over them, but it's not a huge a deal as they made it out to be. It was just something new and cool to have in video games back then. The graphics are pretty good for their time, but the music really isn't. You need to have fun, exciting music for a Sega Rally game. In the end, people just didn't latch onto this one, and Sega Rally sailed off into the sunset. Medium right. Easy left. 90 right. But hold up, we got Sega Rally 3 in the arcades the next year. This is based on Sega Rally Revo, and it plays like Sega Rally 1. That means you have three tracks to race on and a fourth hidden one, but I'm not quite good enough at the game to get there yet. The graphics are sharper, smoother, and generally look a lot better than Sega Rally Revo. What's more is that the control has been improved tenfold. This one is actually lots of fun to play. Being an arcade game though, there's not a ton here. However, there is a classic mode where you can choose the cars from Sega Rally 1 and race on its first stage. This one lasts for three laps and you're racing only one enemy. Unfortunately, they didn't redo any of the other tracks for this, but hey, it's better than nothing. The music might even be better than Sega Rally Revo, but I can barely hear it. That's okay though, probably for the best. Caribbean right. Medium left. Medium right. Medium left. Maybe. Checkpoint. Sega Rally 3 came home to the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 as a digital title three years later as Sega Rally Online Arcade. This is basically exactly like Sega Rally 3, except that you can race online. The graphics do lose some fidelity and the frame rate is halved on the trip home, but it still looks quite nice. Fortunately, the control remains excellent. Even the classic track is here, though it is missing the helicopter that flies in at the end of the third lap. This is what Sega Rally Revo should have been like the first time around. 
If it had this quality from the get-go, in addition to the modes that it has, maybe it would have had more fans. We haven't seen anything from the series since this game was released in 2011. Samurai Showdown, or Samurai Spirits as it's known in Japan, was first released on the Neo Geo in 1993. I've talked about the series many times before, but in brief, it's a super cool weapons-based one-on-one fighter. The first game was ported to a bunch of different consoles. We got five fighting game entries on the Neo Geo here. Hell, we even got an RPG set in the series on the Neo Geo CD, PlayStation, and Saturn. Japanese only, of course. Needless to say, this was one of the more popular series on the Neo Geo, and rightfully so. While Samurai Showdown 5 was released on the Neo Geo in 2003, we'd actually get Samurai Showdown 6 in 2005. This one is also called Samurai Spirits Tenkaichi Kankakuden. This was released in the arcade, PlayStation 2, and digitally on the PlayStation 3 and 4. This is also part of the Samurai Showdown anthology in North America and Europe. I haven't covered this one before. Heck, I haven't even played it until right now. And what do you know, it's a Samurai Showdown game. You can select from 40 different characters. Then you can choose your preferred fighting style based on the previous games. The gameplay is just what you'd expect and it's mostly pretty damn good. The graphics are low-resolution sprites on top of super high-resolution backgrounds with a slight 3D element to some of the stages. The music is hit and miss as it tries to be regional. Then, in 2008, Samurai Showdown Sen was released in the arcades, and it came to the much ballyhooed Xbox 360 console in 2010. This is a 3D fighting game, and it did not impress very many people. The visuals are extremely dull and lack any life whatsoever, much like myself. But even more dull is the gameplay itself. It barely even feels like a Samurai Showdown game at all. It's never exciting, and it almost killed the franchise due to poor reviews and nobody caring about it. In fact, I covered this one in episode 229, Franchise Killers 3, if you'd like a more in-depth look at it. The series would remain dormant all the way up until 2019, when Samurai Showdown came out. That's right, once again, they just gave it the same name as the original game because that's how publishers roll these days, I guess. This one's available for all the modern consoles circa 2019, and I'm playing it on the PlayStation 4 here. I'm amazed that they were willing to take another chance after the reception that Samurai Showdown Sen received. The good news is that this one is a much welcome return to form for the series. Spoiler, it's actually all good news here. We have 2D fighting, just as it should be. It fits in very well with the series. You can choose from 30 different characters right at the get-go. The controls give you a weak, medium, and hard slash as well as a kick. Once again, just like it should be. The rage gauge has also been retained. Gone, however, are the referee and the guy running around who drops items. Gotta be honest, it would have been cool if they were still in here. You can still drop your weapon though, and you still get the button mashing icon when you get in close with your swords. The artwork looks fantastic with a very inky vibe. It was probably inspired by Street Fighter 4 and 5. The backgrounds look especially nice, with many stages taking place in the same spot they did in previous games. I love how the characters get bloody as they take damage. Sometimes, though, the blood can fall off during a match, leaving you suspiciously clean. And thankfully, the music is perfect for the game. What can I say? It sounds like a Samurai Showdown game. <laughs> Other than some missing elements like the referee, I don't really have any issues with this one. It's a lot of fun, and I definitely recommend it if you're a fan of the series. Thankfully, the Samurai Showdown franchise has been redeemed.
俺の名はハオーマル And there you go, six franchises that got a second chance. You know, I'm really glad that this episode made me buy those Doom games because I love those new ones to death, especially Doom Eternal. Now, there are plenty of examples of other franchises where the publishers decided to give it another go, but what are some of your favorites? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Did you lose your only deck of cards and you really want to play? Well, don't fret. Use TurboGrafx and PC Engine Hue cards instead. Hue cards are unique and you can assign your own values to each card. For example, perhaps Shinobi can be the Three of Hearts, while Soldier Blade could be, say, the Ace of Clubs. It's all up to you. Got me a full house, bitches. Read them and weep. Don't use thicker cards as these could easily be identified by nefarious players to cheat. Sure, a deck of 52 cards might be a bit fatter than a real deck of cards and perhaps a bit tougher to shuffle. But the good news is that a deck of Hue cards costs only about 517 times more than a regular deck and they're at least 520 times as fun. So if you've grown up, put away those childish video games and have fun the way adults do, playing cards.